the leader of one of the most exciting projects coming soon to Atlanta. The National Center for Civil and Human Rights will be the next landmark location to add to Centennial Park, sitting between the aquarium and the new world of Coca-Cola. He is an expert on the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and numerous advocates of civil and human rights globally. Plywood presents Doug Shipman. So what have I been up to for the last seven years? Seven years ago, almost to the day, Mayor Shirley Franklin called and said, I need help. I've been approached by some of the icons of the American Civil Rights Movement, many of whom live in Atlanta, to come up with a new institution that will reframe the way that we understand civil rights history in a way that's relevant to people who didn't live through the civil rights movement, which now is most of America and most of the world didn't actually live through the 60s. So we need to reframe it in a way that actually tackles human rights issues that we face today. Oh, and it needs to be in Atlanta, and oh, we have to raise a lot of money to do it, and I need help figuring all of that out. And I happen to be the guy to get that phone call. And like many of you may realize, when you undertake something like this, if you knew what you know at the end, you probably wouldn't have said yes at the beginning. But I said yes with enthusiasm because I had a real passion around civil rights history and human rights issues. And so I tackled this challenge, which was nothing less than literally trying to raise millions of dollars in the worst economy that we've ever seen to build an institution called a museum, which is almost always a failure. Museums almost always run huge deficits every year. And do it in a way that would actually speak and educate to people and educate people who had not lived through what you were trying to tell them about and make them care about something that they really didn't understand and do all of that in a short period of time. On average, it takes 13 years to build one of these things. So you have to find a way to sustain it. That was the challenge, to build the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Oh, and about a year into the project, Shirley Franklin also as mayor led the effort to buy the King Papers collection, a collection of 50,000 items related to Dr. King's life, everything from his Nobel Peace Prize handwritten speech to his C plus report card from graduate school. Some of you may know he got a C plus in public speaking. It's a true story. This was the, gonna be the place to exhibit that world-class collection. So that was the problem that was trying to be solved. And in addition to that, one important fact, Civil rights history, as we understand it, and human rights issues rarely live together because of the way the histories have developed. And there was no public institution that was aimed at this market. So that was the challenge. So what I want to do is just uh, share a few stories as to how I tackled that challenge. Hopefully as thought starters, conversation starters, something relevant for you. The first question that I asked myself was, how am I personally going to embody this effort? As you might see, I'm white. <laughs> I've always been white. And I always will be. And most people would not expect a younger white guy to be leading the effort to build something called Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. So I had to very quickly figure out how I was gonna embody the effort. And there were a few things that happened. First of all, I tried to figure out how I was part of what we were after, how I literally was part of the mission. I spent a lot of time thinking about that, and I realized that one of the biggest fears that anybody who lives through a historical moment has is that people will not remember them and will not remember their efforts once they're gone, that literally they'll be forgotten. And so I was able to actually begin to embody the audience that a lot of the folks who had dreamt this up wanted to reach because of my youth. And so I would play that up. I would, you know, try to dress younger and I, no, I'm kidding. It's not true. I would not do any of those things. But I would actually embody the fact that I was the target audience for the mission for the institution. Second thing that happened from an embodiment perspective that was really an accident was that I realized in, in studying this and then in meeting a lot of folks who were involved in the civil rights movement and a lot of folks who were involved in contemporary human rights movements is that a lot of them come out of a religious tradition. A lot of them come out of a faith perspective. And it just so happened that my father was a minister, um, a Christian minister. And so this became something that I would work into conversations, that this was part of my own identity. And it was amazing how many times I went from outsider or pretender for this work to insider with one small fact. 
tapping into that and knowing how powerful that was allowed me to embody this effort. The third was I was able to embody certain aspects, but I didn't have to embody other aspects of the project. Because when you have someone like Shirley Franklin as mayor, African-American woman, first African-American woman to lead a major city, when you have civil rights icons who are on the board or on the project, I only had to target certain things that I had to embody. I didn't have to literally embody the whole thing. And so I began to think about which things actually I didn't have to embody anymore. I concentrated more on human rights. I let the civil rights aspects be embodied by others. And so this was a kind of a systematic effort to make sure that when I was trotted out as the person who was carrying the torch, that I wasn't going to be burned by the torch I was carrying. Second, once I figured out how I was going to embody it, I started wanting to, to what I call tap into the founding myth. Lincoln at Gettysburg, when he spoke after the battle had occurred, at the grave sites, he reframed America not as growing out of the US Constitution, but as growing out of the Declaration of Independence. And it may not seem like a big move, but when you're talking about issues of slavery, it's a huge move. Because the Constitution, of course, has slavery inside its own fabric. Declaration of Independence say all men are created equal. Lincoln made a specific move to try to move the country into a, more, a place of more equality by saying we're actually founded on the Declaration of Independence, which carries no force of law and away from the Constitution. Martin Luther King Jr., when he stood on the Lincoln Memorial's steps, not accidental, the first half of the I Have a Dream speech, which nobody ever remembers, he said, I have come and my people have come to cash a check that we received when we were born as citizens, and it came back marked insufficient funds. He reframed the entire freedom struggle away from laws and back to the Declaration of Independence. We're citizens, we deserve to be free, that's the end of the story. And he won that struggle. So I thought a lot about how do you tap into a founding myth for a new institution in Atlanta that's going to try to reframe civil rights history into contemporary human rights issues. And I found willing accomplices by looking at the speeches that the civil rights icons, Andy Young, Joseph Lowry, Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King Jr. had all given when they were in their 20s and 30s. Because they had all talked about the civil rights movement as a human rights movement. They rarely use the term civil rights movement. They all talked about the human rights movement, and they all talked about it being a global movement, and they all talked about it reaching far beyond the issues of color and ethnicity onto other issues. And so their own words were the words that I used in order to be the founding myth for the whole project, both for them, to help them move into new territory, and for others to understand how you could link these two seemingly opposed things in the same institution. It was vitally important to have that myth. Here's the other one. The other myth is the one of Atlanta. Atlanta's greatest myth is not the city too busy to hate. Atlanta's greatest myth is that we can tear old things down and build new things over them. That's the greatest myth that this city particularly carries with it. And so that's exactly the founding myth that we tapped into to say, look, the civil rights legacy, it has to be transformed into something new in order for it to live beyond just the lives of those who led it, in order for it to be relevant to things like the Arab uprisings, in order for it to be relevant to things like the debates around immigration in the United States, around women in the Middle East, and all kinds of other issues. And it has been very, very fertile ground from which to found the project. So one was my own sort of relationship to the project. The second was how, you thought, how I thought about the project itself and where it was coming from. The third thing was then a very specific challenge. How to confront the actual business challenge that this faced. Most museums have to raise over half of their money every single year. Most of them build themselves far too large. Most of them don't think about the business plan early enough. Most of them don't have enough business sophistication to run the institution successfully. All of these things are things I wish did not exist. And there are things that at, t at times my board has wanted to sweep under the rug. But this is something that you cannot afford to do, at least you couldn't afford to do in my project, because this was the thing that ultimately would kill the entire dream. It's the thing that would ultimately allow, not allow the mission to be fulfilled. So what we did is the first thing we did, before we wrote uh, really a business plan, uh, before we wrote a, 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 a mission statement in full, before we wrote a storyline, before we got an architect, before we got an exhibition designer, before we did any of those things, we wrote a business plan and we wrote literally a 30-page Excel business model, a pro forma for all operations for this non-existing institution that we hadn't raised a dime for yet. 
And the reason was because that allowed us to constantly compare all the decisions we were making back to the business implications for those decisions. No matter how great the mission was, no matter how great the vision was, no matter how excited we were about something, we plugged it back through the pro forma to see what the implications were on the actual operations of the business. And at every step of the way, it has led us to the question that I think a lot of times people in my industry, the museum and attraction world, don't ask quickly enough, which is not how big can we build it, but how few resources can we use in order to do our mission? Or said differently, how small can we be? Because the thing that kills these institutions is that you big, build them too large, is that you get overextended, you get debt, you think that you're going to make it up on the back end, and you never do. And so from the very beginning, we actually counterintuitively have been running everything through a business pro forma so that we knew those implications. And it's worked. It's kept us out of a lot of trouble. It has, kept us, it has put us in a position to actually be able to downsize what we think we are going to do and actually to increase the programs because the biggest decision you make is how big your footprint is in, an, in a project like this. Fourth thing we've had to confront and the next two are somewhat diametrically opposed. It's constantly changing and sharpening the pitch. I've probably given the pitch for the center over the last seven years no less than about 1,500 times, just generally speaking. No two times have been the same. Because at least in my world, there have been new things that have come along in which I've had to respond to, and if I wasn't responding to them, I would lose a lot of credibility and the organization will lose a lot of credibility. For instance, the Arab uprisings, which I mentioned, a huge issue for anyone who's in the human rights world. So understanding how we are going to link as an exhibition, as an education, as a programmatic entity to an event like that has been a huge question on people's minds, sometimes raised, sometimes not. But I have had to make sure that I've sharpened the pitch in order to respond to that reality. A negative reality, I don't know how many of you have, uh, been, have followed when it was happening, the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Anybody follow the NASCAR Hall of Fame? Does anybody know what NASCAR is? They, ride, you know, they drive cars around the track? Right. NASCAR Hall of Fame was going to come to Atlanta. It was a big chase, no pun intended, that, was, uh, that the city undertook in order to win the institution. Atlanta ended up losing to Charlotte. Charlotte ended up building the NASCAR Hall of Fame. It started out as an $85 million project. It ballooned into a $135 million project. They issued lots of debt in order to get it built. They expected about 600,000 people to come. You know how many people came last year? About 250,000. What do you think that does to their business model? It's very problematic. It is in dire straits. And every single person who knows about the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and I'm glad all of you don't because you won't ask me this question, but every person who does, which are a lot of potential funders, say, how are you different than the NASCAR Hall of Fame? That has become the comparison set from which I have to respond all the time. So I've had to constantly sharpen my pitch, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And I think that sometimes we get so caught up with the excitement about our own pitches and we think we have to refine it and then we get it down and we get it down to a certain time frame and we get it down to a certain number of words and we get it down to exactly what we think sings that we forget that the people listening are constantly changing. The target's constantly moving. And I will say the other thing is a fun part of my experience obviously has been raising money. We've raised about $75 million. We've done it in big chunks and small chunks. On the pitch side, I have spent more time raising some $25,000 um, donors than I have some $5 million donors. In fact, we raised about $5 million from one donor in a 130-minute meeting because the pitch was just right, but it was not the pitch I walked in with. It happened that this donor was a huge fan of a particular writer of civil rights history that I knew, and as soon as he mentioned that, the entire meeting went in that direction. It changed the whole course of the conversation. And 30 minutes later, we basically were on our way to a $5 million contribution. I have gotten the pitch wrong and have, I literally have been going around on a $500,000 contribution for a year and a half and I can't seem to get the pitch right and I it was working on it today because I can't seem to find exactly what it is that's going to hit the chord for them. We love our projects more than anybody else. If you don't hear anything else I say, hear this. We love our projects more than anyone else. Never forget it. Because you have to change your pitch to hit the target, not to sound good in your own mind. Now, I said these are sort of diametrically opposed. You gotta articulate clear boundaries. 
Like I said, one of the clearest boundaries we articulated was having a pro forma up front that we ran everything through. National Center for Civil and Human Rights. As soon as it got out what we were actually doing and that we were embracing a broad palette of human rights, I promise you every activist from every issue group in the country found my phone number. And they said, this is fantastic. We've been waiting for a place like this, but let me tell you, you better give us more than just a corner 